is to ignore certain kinds of atrocities that are committed by us and our friends mm -hmm. and to play up enormously atrocities that are that are uh, committed by them and, and, and our enemies. Um, and, and you posit, in fact, you say in the Massey Lectures that there's a test of integrity and moral honesty, which is to to have a kind of equality of treatment of corpses. Equality well, of I, principles. I, I mean, that every dead person should be in principle equal that's to what every other dead person. That's not what I say at all. Well, well I'm glad that's not what you say, because, because I, that's I, not what you do. Of course it's not what I do, nor would I say it. I mean, right. that, in fact, I say the opposite. What I say is that we should be responsible for our own actions primarily. That's something quite but, different. But it isn't, 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 I wasn't equating them, I was comparing the treatment of them. In my, if you want my value judgment, we should give much more attention to one priest who we've killed than to a hundred priests that they've killed. Notice that this is exactly the, that's exactly my method. Because your method is to ignore, uh, is not, not so much to, not only to ignore cor the corpses created by them, but also to ignore the corpses that are created by neither side, but which are irrelevant to your ideological. That's yeah. totally untrue. Well, well let, let me give you an example. Um, that uh, that um, one of your one of your own causes that you take very seriously is the cause of the Palestinians, and and a Palestinian corpse weighs, weighs very heavily on your conscience. And yet a Kurdish corpse does not. That's not um, true at all. I've uh, been involved in Kurdish support groups for years. Um, uh, uh, a, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely false. I mean, just ask the Kurdish, ask the people who are involved in. I mean, you know, they come to me. I sign their petitions and so on and so forth. And in fact, if you look at the stuff, at the things we've written, I mean, take, 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 take a look. I mean, I'm not Amnesty International. I can't do everything. I'm a single unit you know, person. But if you read, say, uh, take take a look, say at. Uh, uh, at, at the book that Edward Herman and I wrote on this topic. We wrote a book about this in 1979. In it, we dis discuss three kinds of atrocities, not two, three kinds of blood deaths. What we call benign blood deaths, which nobody cares about, constructive blood deaths, which are the ones we like, and nefarious blood deaths, which are the ones that the bad guys do. Constructive blood deaths are things like the Indonesian massacres, which we supported. Uh, nefarious bloodbaths are like Pol Pot. But we also discussed ones that nobody cares about, like Burundi. For example, we have probably the only discussion in the literature, I guess, of the massacres that were going on in Burundi at that time. Uh, we probably have the only discussion in the literature, at least that I know of, of uh, the uh, massacres that were going on in Burma. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, in fact, not only is what you say not true, but it's the opposite of the truth. We went out of our way to find the kinds of bloodbaths that are just ignored because nobody cares about them. Now again, let me stress, I'm not Amnesty International. I do not have the, uh, either the, uh, I don't have, uh, the, you know, the ludicrous egotism which makes me the uh, arbiter of uh, uh, all atrocities over the world, right? I'm not trying to give an A to this country and a B minus to this country and so on. The principle that I think we ought to follow is not the one that you stated. It's the principle that we rightly expect Soviet dissidents to follow. So what principle do we expect Sakharov to follow, let's say? What lets us decide whether Sakharov's a moral person? I think he is. Uh, Sakharov does not treat every corpse as a, it does not treat every tro atrocity as identical. He has nothing to say about American atrocities. And when he's asked, he says, I don't know anything about them, I don't care about them. What he talks about is Soviet atrocities. And that's right, because those are the ones that he's responsible for. Uh, his, just, just as in, you know, it's, it's a very simple ethical point. You're responsible for the predictable consequences of your actions. You're not responsible for the predictable consequences of somebody else's actions. Now, we understand this when we're talking about dissidents in the Soviet Union, okay? But we refuse to understand it when we're talking about ourselves for very good reasons. Commissars in the Soviet Union don't understand it about dissidents. Commissars in the Soviet Union attack Sakharov and other dissidents because they don't talk about American crimes. Right? We understand exactly why that's just hypocrisy and cynicism when they do it. And we should understand the same when we do it. Now the fact of the matter is that I spend a fair amount of effort on crimes of official enemies. There are a fair number of people in the United States and Canada uh, from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe who are there because of my personal activities on their behalf. I don't take any pride in that particularly, I just do it because I'm interested in it. The most important thing uh, for me and for you is to think about the consequences of your actions. What can you affect? Those are the ones you primarily ought to be concerned about. Of course every corpse is a corpse, but there's some that you can affect and there are others you can't do much about.
You know, like I can be worried about things that happened in the 18th century, but I can't do much about them. This is Peter Worthington, editor of the Ottawa Sun. It strikes me that you're living refutation of, of the thesis that you can't get a certain point of view across. You've hardly been a shrinking violet over the past 30 years, but it seems to me the effect of your theme has been virtually zilch, except for a few of the elite who support it. It seems to me the great mass of the American people, the workers, uh, either don't understand it or, or reject it totally. First of all, I don't agree with your factual assumption. Uh, I think it's exactly the opposite of the truth. You, among the, what, what, you, well, what you said is that uh, you, you said correctly that I haven't been a shrinking violet, and you said the effect has been zilch except for elements of the elite. The facts are exactly the opposite. The effects on the elite are zero, and the effects on the general population are not insignificant. Uh, I don't, not just me, it's I'm one person. There are a lot of people doing this sort of thing, and we have much greater outreach than we've ever had before, not through the elite media. I mean, when I, I, as I said before, I travel around the country all the time. Uh, I can't accept a fraction of the invitations that come. I'm booked up solidly two years in advance, and I probably don't accept maybe 10% of the invitations that come in. Uh, this works well for you. But, see, there's a reason for that. That was not true 20 years ago. When I got started in this, I was talking to people. If I could talk to three neighbors in a living room, I'd consider it a good evening. You know, I was giving talks on the Boston Common, where we had to be protected by the police to protect to prevent us from being murdered and that was going on until 1966 you know and um, boston is a, is a liberal city incidentally and this was with the support of the media but the media the, wasn't ignoring you oh totally totally i mean well, how look, come all of the in the 1960s in the 1960s well let I me mean, see that there are a lot of illusions about this in the 1960s the media were completely closed to anybody like me that includes public radio for example the most liberal segment of the american media it's probably National Public Radio in Boston, where I live, and I'm not unknown. During the entire Vietnam War, when I was very well known for opposition to the war, I was on National Public Radio once for, I think, five minutes, if I remember, uh, after I came back from Vietnam with an extremely hostile interview by the most liberal commentator, Louis M. Lyant. That was it. Now, uh, I, I, was, I could never be in the, in the newspapers or anything of that sort. Uh, by the early 70s it began to change a little and by the late 70s it changed more and in the 1980s it's considerably more i mean it's still very limited but if i wanted to i could probably at this point say write op-eds for quality local press not the new york times but say the minneapolis star tribune or something that was unimaginable in the 60s yeah, but that's it was, the elite sure it's not no you see but that's a reflection of see i think that's missing the point in the elites are about as closed as they always were but the general population has changed, and that's beginning to affect the institutions. I mean, outreach to the general population is much easier than before. No, I mean, I gave my own experience, but it's, other people do the same. I have the same experience. You talk to much wider groups, much bigger audiences. They're much more sophisticated. I mean, in the, at, in the peak of the peace movement, I was always cutting corners. I would never say what I thought. I never talked about the U.S. attack against South Vietnam in the 1960s, even in student, you know, student activist groups, because they wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Nowadays, I ne I, and I never talked about institutions. I never criticized. You know, I, I, today I talked a little about capitalist democracy. I never talked about that kind of thing in the 60s. It was just too exotic, you know. But I don't cut any corners anymore, anywhere. I can be giving a talk in eastern Kentucky or, you know, central Iowa or something else, and I say exactly what I think, and people generally understand it. They may not agree, they may be surprised, but they want to listen and they want to think about it. Those are changes outside of the elite circles. Noam Chomsky. I'm Mr. Sinclair. Several weeks ago, Professor Chomsky presented some of the material in these lectures to an audience at Ryerson Polytechnical Institute in Toronto, after which he was questioned by a panel of Canadian journalists. This is David Frum, associate editor of Saturday Night Magazine. Professor Chomsky, you, you argue for a model of the media in which the media argue for and defend the established institutions of society, and any deviation from that defense uh, is is dismissed or, or even even suppressed, so that views that are dis that dissent from the uh, overwhelming consensus that 
characterizes our society cannot get a hearing. Now, here you are tonight uh, in a large lecture hall, Canada's most prestigious journalism school, speaking to an audience of journalists who are hearing your remarks with apparent approbation. Uh, your remarks are being broadcast on the government-owned radio network uh, as part of the most prestigious lecture series uh, on that network. How'd that happen? Recall that what I said was that this is a very good first approximation to the description of a complex social institution. Uh, now, I, you remember that I mentioned, I, I'm afraid this remark may sound a little insulting, but let me try to say it without sounding that way. I specifically mentioned that uh, in the United States, for example, the, uh, if I wasn't talking about, say, listener-sported radio in a small community. In fact, as you get away from the elite centers that matter, things open up. Okay. Now, the fact of the matter is that Canada is a much more open society in this respect than the United States, and the reason is it's less important. Uh, uh, this generalizes. I can talk this way in Belgium, you know, in Israel, in uh, Latin America. I can't talk, th th I mean, I can talk this way in the United States, but not on national radio and television, because it's just too important. Uh, what people think about international affairs in Canada just doesn't matter that much to uh, established power. If it did matter that much, Canada would close up too. If CBC then is just a small uh, a publicly funded station in some small town looked upon in that uh, perspective, why don't we turn to the CBC uh, uh, <laughs> person on stage here and Margaret Daly, perhaps you can have a, a turn. Well, I was uh, intrigued by the thesis and, and uh, particularly impressed by the volume of sort of factual documentation that I look forward to reading this, this stuff in a long version. I guess the question that I want to ask, though, is given that this information is so, given that this information isn't discussed, you lay it all out, supposing people knew it, and obviously individuals do know it, minorities, intellectuals, uh, foreign affairs buffs, if you want to call them that, those kinds of people can, can assemble all this information. Then what? what diff it, does, it doesn't seem to make any difference, and why is that? Well, I think it does make a difference. I think it makes a lot of difference. Uh, I mentioned, not entirely jocularly, that if a third world country today were to put forth the American Constitution, we'd call it a reversion to Nazism. And I mentioned that that's a sign of hope and progress. There has been moral progress over 200 years. There's also been progress over 20 years, uh, 30 years, I mean, my active lifetime. Uh, again, I'm talking mostly about the United States, but it's a different country than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, now, elites are not different. They're pretty much as indoctrinated as they always were. Elite group, contrary to a lot of necessary illusion, Elite groups, including liberal intellectual elites, did not oppose the Vietnam War. They supported the Vietnam War, supported it enthusiastically. Uh, they began to turn against it somewhat after Wall Street turned against it, and more or less for the same reasons, because it was too costly. Uh, the, the media were almost totally closed, the critics of the war. Uh, but among the general population, this crisis of democracy did take place, and it changed the society. I think it led to a probably, I hope, a permanent cultural change outside the elite centers. And the United States is just a different country than it was 20 years ago in a lot of respects. Uh, everything from interpersonal relations to treatment of ethnic minorities to uh, concern over international affairs and so on. You can see, and, and the reason is because outside of the, uh, outside of the, the, while the major institutions of indoctrination continue on their natural course, other modes of interaction did develop, and they remained, you know, they're informal, they're, they're inefficient, uh, they may, I mean, I spend an, I, probably 80 percent, I don't know, some huge percent of my time traveling around the country giving talks. Well, you know, that's less efficient than writing for a major journal, but uh, people do this, and ultimately it makes a difference. There are solidarity groups, there are all kind of organizations and so on, and they do make a difference. You can see it. So take, for example, I, I mentioned the uh, U.S. attack against South Vietnam in the early 1960s. Uh, you compare the early 1960s with the 1980s, that's 20 years, uh, when Ronald Reagan came into office, he, his administration, in my view, intended to uh, emulate uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, except they, their target was Central America. 
the, they came out with a white paper in February 1981, right after they came into office, virtually a declaration of war. The communists are taking over the world. We've got to go in there and stop them. Uh, it was a precursor to, to direct U.S. military intervention in Central America. Now, what happened? What happened, well, and the, the media, incidentally, bought the whole story. There was virtually no criticism of the white paper when it came out, just enthusiastic support for it. However, the general population didn't because the population is not what it was in the early 60s. When John F. Kennedy started sending the American Air Force to bomb South Vietnam on a regular basis, there was no protest. You couldn't get two people together in a living room to talk about it. it was, and it didn't have to be hidden either. It was on the front page of the newspapers. Nobody cared. We want to bomb another country? Great. Now let's go to the next thing. Uh, when Ronald Reagan's administration announced, sort of indicated that they might try to turn to direct military intervention, there was a convulsion in the country. Uh, people started coming out of the woodworks. It ranged from a massive flow of letters to Washington, to demonstrations, to church groups getting involved. A whole array of protests began to develop spontaneously without any organization and structure. The reason is the country is just a lot different. Well, what happened? Uh, what happened is that the Reagan administration backed off. They, in fact, told the media to cool the rhetoric, to cut back the inflammatory rhetoric. They were afraid that much more central themes of their program would be endangered. After all, remember that they were trying to ram through a program that the population was strongly opposed to, a domestic economic program. They were trying to ram through destruction of the limited welfare measures that exist in the United States, a huge transfer of resources from the poor to the rich, a massive increase in state power, uh, and huge public subsidy to the to high technology industry through the Pentagon system and so on. All of these things are contrary to what the public wanted, and they didn't want any protest about them. Uh, so what they did was back off from their inflammatory proclamations about Central America, and they went underground. That's what the Iran-Contra hearings were about. The administration was driven underground. The domestic population would not tolerate the activities that they wanted to carry out, and they therefore had to turn to illegal clandestine activities. Now, the Reagan administration was notorious for the level of its clandestine activities, and clandestine activities are a pretty good measure of popular dissidents. If there isn't any popular dissidents, you don't have to carry out clandestine activities. You can carry out overt international terrorism and violence, which is much more efficient. Overt violence is much more efficient than clandestine violence, for obvious reasons. I mean, for, for one thing, it's just more efficient to do. For another thing, there isn't any risk that it'll be exposed which will cause, you know, a scandal and so on and so forth. So the, and in fact, the state was driven underground by popular dissidents. Well, that's important. You know, those, those are, I think that's one of the many reflections of the difference between the 1960s and the 1980s. I think there's, and in fact, even the media are different. Bad as they are, I mean, as you can see, I'm no great enthusiast for the elite media, but they're better than they were 20 years ago. I mean, the, they're not as closed and restricted and constrained as they were 20 years ago. And that includes the elite media. So there, there are slow changes. And I think there is a slow move towards general democratization, much too slow, but not insignificant. And uh, 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 those are things that, first of all, one can be somewhat hopeful about, but it also teaches you a lesson. It means there are things you can do. After all, these are societies. Our societies, like Canada and the United States, have one tremendous virtue. The state is very restricted in its capacity to use force against citizens. By comparative, it's not zero, but by comparative standards, it's low. And that means there's a great range of options available. People want to make use of them, and many do, and it, has a, it makes a difference. Noam Chomsky. I'm Lister Sinclair. This is Gene Allen, foreign editor of the Globe and Mail. Many of the things you describe about how the elite press in the United States sees the world are replayed to us through some of the main communications links that we rely on, such as Associated Press, or Reuters News Agency, New York Times News Service. And I think um, many Canadian journalists are in the position of recognizing a strong uh, U.S. bias uh, in, those, in those reports and in are active in that's one of the day-to-day -day challenges is trying to find ways of getting around that uh, 
one of the things you can do is get your own correspondents there who have a different point of view or try and get local stringers. You can't do that all the time. Um, but I just wonder from that, it, from, from my point of view anyway, it seems that perhaps a lot of what you describe could be simply interpreted as kind of uh, the American press playing cheerleader for the home team. It's just like there's a kind of sports writer who's called a homer, you know, and the home team can do no wrong. Um, can you look at it that way, just as an issue of American foreign policy? And yeah. countries like, like Canada can, uh, can, can have some effective room to maneuver in terms of covering the world. Well, I think, uh, I, I think there's something to that. But, you know, we have to be careful about what's the home team. I mean, uh, for example, w what the American press defends is the interests of elite elements in the United States. Now, it may be that the general population is strongly opposed to elite elements, but they're not the home team. It's the elite elements that are home, the home team for the reasons that I mentioned. So on, say, Central America, there's no doubt that the general population has been pretty much opposed to these policies, but the home team is in favor of them and the press is in favor of them. On, let's take Vietnam, the Vietnam War. There, that was very interesting. At first, the general population was strongly in support of the war, strongly in support, but uh, it changed. By about 1969, uh, the population was largely opposed to the war and on interesting grounds. They were, the population was opposed in principle. Again, you take a look at the Gallup polls up until today, or at least two years ago, which is the last one I saw, the popula about 70% of the population regularly says the Vietnam War was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Now, among opinion leaders, it's not 70%. It's like 40%. Opinion leaders includes clergy and businessmen and so on. When you get to the real intellectual elite, the percentage is about zero. Uh, there's actual, even at the peak of opposition to the war, like in around 1970, the real intellectual elite, you know, as picked by various standards, was of course opposed to the war, so was everybody, including Wall Street, but, because it was just not paying anymore, but they were opposed on pragmatic grounds. It wasn't working, it was too costly, it was maybe too bloody, and so on. But fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, that's, that position is barely expressed in the ideological system, but it's the position of about 70% of the population. Now, here we have a striking case where, you know, the, 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 the home team that you're working for is not the general population. It's a very specific interest in the general population. I think that's true in a lot of issues. Let's take, say, uh, take, say, uh, turn to a totally different question. Take uh, uh, te a nuclear test ban. Uh, uh, just, just through popular grassroots organization, the population was about 75 percent in favor of a nuclear test ban uh, two or three years ago. Elites were strongly opposed to it, liberal, conservative, everyone else. They were so strongly opposed to it that when the Soviet Union declared a, a unilateral test ban, the media barely covered it. I mean, they noticed it and disparaged it and told various lies about it. And when it was renewed, it was barely even covered. Uh, and this was, it was never, it was hardly even an issue in the elections, even though 75% of the population was in favor of it, had virtually no elite support except maybe an occasional gesture. Uh, that's a very strong elite position, but it's not reflecting general, the general public. Uh, so, so, I, I, so, so I think there's something to what you say, but I think one has to be more discriminating about how to define the home team. The home team means the people who own the country and therefore ought to govern it. Or the official home team. Yeah. yeah. Peter Worthington, editor of the Ottawa Sun. Your talk of the Vietnam War, the turning against it, uh, and, you, and you said for, for moral grounds because it was uh, an immoral war. On the general like. population, yes. not the well, elites. I, my view would be that it, the public turned against it, uh, regardless of the point that I think it was a mistake, but I think the public turned against it primarily because it was a losing war. And can you give me any indication of a winning war that's been unpopular? Well, uh, can I give any indication of a winning war that's unpopular? See, I, quite honestly, I think the Vietnam War was a winning war from the United well, States for the United it States. It looks like a winning war. Uh, from see, well, we well, see, but that's because see, but that's indoctrination. We're propaganda. That's yeah. indoctrination. Oh, yeah, I see. see, in order to decide, we, well, let's be no, careful. You've, well, that's fine. No, we're, well, so long let, as let's I know that let's we're let's be careful. To decide whether a war is a winning war or not, you have to figure out first why it was fought, right? 
That's what tells you whether it was a winning war. There are a variety of ways to tell it's That's winning. right. There are a lot of ways to, well, but one of the ways, if you're logical, is to ask what were the goals of the war and were those goals achieved? That's the way you decide whether a war is a winning war, right? If we do that, uh, uh, we're not going to do this in one second, but let me again just talk methodologically because there's no time to go through the whole story. You can look up the documents. Uh, there's elaborate documentation on the background planning for the Vietnam War, elaborate documentation on the high-level planning. And the main concern all along was that independent nationalism in Vietnam might be what was called a, a rotten apple that would infect the barrel. Uh, it might have a demonstration effect throughout the region, very much like Nicaragua. And there's a way you deal with that. The way you deal with a virus that might infect the region, the virus in this case being independent nationalism, the way you deal with it is by destroying the virus and inoculating the region from the spread. Now that was done. There was the, the Vietnam War had a dual character. You had to destroy the possibility of independent development in Vietnam, and you had to create around it brutal military dictatorships which would prevent the spread and both of those things were done reasonably effectively. Part of the Vietnam War was the support for the Indonesian massacres in 1965, a very significant part. Part of the concern over Vietnam was that it would encourage the growth of the of independent politics in Indonesia where you had a huge mass-based uh, peasant-based communist party and success in Vietnam might have spurred that on. In 1965, that party was wiped out with the slaughter of maybe 700,000 people to enthusiastic support in the West, I should say. That was part of the inoculation of the region. Same happened in Thailand, same happened in the Philippines with the Marcos coup, all around the region. Meanwhile, Vietnam was sufficiently destroyed, so the chances of it being a model for anyone else are very slight. I mean, Vietnam will probably not barely survives. You know, it, it's, it's suffered the kind of fate that there's nothing to compare with in European history back to the Black Plague. You know, be a century before they even recover, if then. So, so the that's a partial, a partial victory. Why it's a, in terms, so, so here you have, you didn't have a total victory. They didn't get their ultimate goal, you know. If, if, if you're only, if you, if, you're willing, if you call success only achievement of every goal, even the minor ones, then it wasn't a victory. But if we give an accurate assessment, it was a partial victory. Uh, partial defeat, partial victory. They didn't reabsorb Indochina back into the American system, but they prevented it from being the threat of a good example. In this respect, the American war in, in Nicaragua is also a partial victory. Now, uh, we, can a we can answer the question what the American population thought about the war. We can answer it because it's a very heavily polled population. And we don't have to speculate. We can look at public opinion studies. And they changed over time. By the late 60s, the population was largely opposed to the war on moral grounds, not on grounds that it was going to fail. By the 70s, with the continued improvement in the cultural climate among the general population, those figures went up. By 1982, it was 72% uh, answering yes to the war is fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. And those figures are particularly dramatic because there was virtually no articulate expression of this view. You go to the extreme doves, you know, Anthony Lewis and so on, they were not saying this. They never said it. What they were saying is it's a mistake. Maybe some of them might have said it's too bloody. If you want some actual evidence on this, don't take my word for it. Go to the evidence. Uh, there is an interesting study uh, called the American Intellectual Elite. Uh, it came out around 1974. It's done by a sociologist named Charles Kedushin. Uh It's a study of the attitudes of people called the American Intellectual Elite. It's a, I agree, it's a totally idiotic concept, but the people he studied are probably no worse a sample than others. I was actually one of them, so I sort of watched the study go on. Uh, this study was taken in, um, in May 1970. That's rather important. If you look back, you'll discover that that was the peak period of opposition to the war, right after the invasion of Cambodia. That was the period when the colleges were closed down, you know, the whole country was blowing up. Right at that point, this survey was taken of the American intellectual elite, you know, people who write for the New York Review of Books and all this kind of fancy stuff. There were 200 people in the sample. Everybody was against the war, but so was Richard Nixon, you know, so that didn't mean anything. Uh, the question is, why were they against the war? Well, 
they broke down into three categories. Most of them were against the war on what the editor called pragmatic grounds, meaning can't get away with it. A smaller percentage, I forget the numbers, I think maybe a third or so, were against the war on what they called moral grounds. Funny word. Uh, moral grounds meant it's too bloody. In other words, you're killing too many children. You know, you kill fewer children, it's okay. Then there was a tiny group, actually it was maybe two or three people in the sample, I was one of them, who were opposed to the war on what the editor called ideological grounds. Now, the term is interesting. Ideological is a bad word, you know. What, what, uh, what, what it means is that this tiny, this statistically irrelevant sample, you know, like 1% or something, were opposed to the war on principle, namely on grounds that aggression is wrong, even if it succeeds. See, if they had asked the question, what do you think about the, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia? The question wasn't asked, but if it had been asked, everybody would have been against it. Nobody would have been against it on pragmatic grounds because it worked. And nobody would have been against it on what are called moral grounds because it wasn't bloody. You know, they only killed one person or something. So it's on moral grounds. You asked everybody that everybody would have been against it on ideological grounds, except nobody would have called that ideological. You would have just called it human or principled but or something. But not in the Soviet Union. I'm they talking were. about the United States. Yeah, but don't, don't Wait, no, put look, America on Russia's war. Sorry. Have the Soviet I, Union sorry, talk you're, about you're, Vietnam. You're missing my point. My point is that opposition that in a U.S. study opposition to an American war, uh, to aggression on grounds of principle is called ideological and it is marginal when it's U.S. aggression and it's, cons and, and it's considered normal and proper when we're talking about Soviet aggression. Now, here's my point. At a time when the population was moving towards over large scale opposition to the war on grounds of principle, the intellectual elite was it, 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 only by statistical error did you find anybody who was opposed in grounds of principle. And that's at the peak period of opposition to the war. I think those things are pretty revealing. I, in fact, I think there's, in my view at least, there's a kind of a split that's taken place in American culture, an interesting sort of split between educated elite opinion, which in fact is jingoistic and indoctrinated and reactionary and so on, whether it calls itself liberal or something else, and the general public which is moving in another direction. Noam Chomsky. I'm Lister Sinclair. This is reporter and filmmaker Kevin McMahon. It's my impression that most of the population feels that it's being propagandized and, and they turn more and more towards the, um, using media as strictly a source of entertainment. You know, it's a postman idea about it doesn't really matter what they say because they say it so stupidly that, uh, that you know, people are just consuming it for a laugh. And, and I wonder if now that doesn't become more of a problem really than propaganda. I mean, p y despite the really impressive evidence that you amass, um, I don't think you, you know, most people would be convinced by a couple of sentences saying we're propagandized. And uh, you, so, yeah, I wonder if, if entertainment isn't, isn't really the greater problem now. Yeah, I think you're, what you said is very important. What I've been talking about gives a kind of a skewed picture. I maybe should have emphasized more, but remember, I'm talking about the elite media. The elite media, and there's, the elite media target largely educated people. They target the political class, the more or less politically active class, a pretty small percentage of the population, the articulate elite intellectuals. And that's the kind of propaganda I've been talking about, and that's only a small part of the system. Uh, things have to be done for the rest of the population, too. They have to be marginalized, but they're not going to be marginalized by uh, telling them uh, lies about foreign policy, because just as you say, they don't believe most of what they read. There's just a kind of a general populist skepticism along with this sense that the government is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves is the sense that the media are probably lying to us. Uh, so for most of the population, the media system is, I think, a different one. It's not just the case that it tries to entertain them. It tries to entertain them through means which will intensify attitudes that support the interests of elites. So you want, for example, let me give some cases. Uh, take the emphasis on professional sports. Now, uh, the, it sounds harmless, but it really isn't. Professional sports are a way of building up jingoist fanaticism. Uh, you're supposed to cheer for your own team. I 
to mention something from personal experience. I remember very well myself when I was, I guess, a high school student, sudden revelation, you know, when I asked myself, why am I cheering for my high school football team? <laughs> I don't know anybody on it. If I met anybody on it, I'd probably hate each other. You know, why do I care whether they win or if some guy a couple blocks away wins? Well, you know, uh, and then you could say the same thing about, you know, the baseball team or whatever else it is. Uh, this idea of cheering for your home team, which you mentioned before, that's a way of building into people irrational uh, submissiveness to power, you know. And it's a very dangerous thing. And I think it's one of the reasons it's such a big, it's, it's, it gets such a huge play. Uh, or t let's move to something else. The indoctrination that's done by TV and so on is not trying to pile up evidence and give arguments and so on. It's trying to inculcate attitudes. I mentioned a couple of cases, but there are a lot more. Let's take, say, the bombing of Libya. Why did the American public support the bombing of Libya? Well, the reason is that there had been a very effective and careful and intense inculcation of racist attitudes about Arabs. I mean, anti-Arab racism is the one form of racism in the United States that's considered legitimate. I mean, plenty of people are racists, but you don't like to admit it, you know. On the other hand, with regard to anti-Arab racism, you admit it openly. I mean, you read a journal like, say, The New Republic, and what the kinds of things that they say about Arabs, uh, if anybody said them about Jews, you'd think you're reading Der Sturmer, you know. I'm, I'm not joking. And nobody notices it, you know, because Arab anti-racism is so profound. It shows up in literature. I mean, there are, there are novels that have a form of anti-Arab racism that's hair-raising, you know. Same is true of television shows and so on and so forth. Uh, an image has been created uh, through, throughout a lot of the, the media part of this, not all, uh, of, uh, you know, the Arab terrorists lurking out there ready to kill us. And against that background, you could bomb Libya and people would cheer. Uh, recall how effective that was. Remember what was happening in 1986. There are a lot of measures of how effective this is. Remember that in 1986, when this happened, the tourism industry in Europe was virtually wiped out because Americans were afraid to go to Europe, where incidentally, objectively, they would be about 100 times as safe as in any American city. That's no <laughs> joke. But they were afraid to go to Europe because they got these Arab terrorists out there trying to kill us, you know? Now, that was not from New York Times editorials. That was from a whole array of television and novels and soap operas and, you know, massive symbolism and so on and so forth. And that's effective. I mean, that's uh, the anti-communist hysteria has developed that way, too. The communists are out there ready to kill us. Who are the communists? I don't know, you know. They're out there ready to kill us, you know. This is introduced by...